Assalamu alaikum, hello and welcome to The Health Show here only on the Islam Channel with me, Alastair Greener. As you know, every week we're joined by a health expert within their specialised field and we discuss the prevention of health issues or concerns that we or our loved ones may face. Looking at how you can change your health and lifestyle for the better, The Health Show offers an alternative viewpoint from our health experts who attend the show. And this way we can guide you through the right directions to improve your life. Now, if you would like any further information on our programme or any of the topics that we discuss, then please do get in touch at healthshow at islamchannel.tv. Now, today I'm pleased to welcome back Dr. Sunil Chopra uh, to continue our conversation about skin care, as we have so much more to talk about. Now, as you may remember from our last interview with Dr. Chopra, he's a consultant dermatologist who works primarily at the London Dermatology Centre. And he has his own private practice where he specialises in skin cancer, scalp and pigmentation problems, acne scarring, as well as being an expert at treating the signs of ageing. Welcome back. Thank you for coming back because we've got so much more to talk about. It's good to be back. Well, before we talk more with you and all about your health concerns regarding your skin, we're going to show you a clip from Pakistan where smoking hashish is very widespread. In fact, many people are surprisingly open about using cannabis. The preferred variant of the drug is spongy black hash made from marijuana, and it's grown in the country's tribal belt and neighbouring Afghanistan. Lighting up in deeply conservative Pakistan, these men are smoking hashish, and lots of it. It's forbidden by their Muslim faith, but in a country where alcohol is banned, smoking marijuana is often a grey area. When I was young, I started smoking with friends one day. The next day, I went out with some other friends and smoked again, and it became a habit. The use of hash predates the arrival of Islam in the region. At this Sufi shrine in Peshawar, Followers gathered to smoke while listening to devotional music and taking tea. Just don't think about drinking anything stronger here. According to a recent UN survey, cannabis is Pakistan's most widely used drug. This single mother says smoking it helps her cope with daily stress. I felt bad when I started the first time, but after some time, I started enjoying it. Music was playing and it sounded good. My friends were really laughing and I liked it. But with many turning a blind eye to marijuana here, its use is unlikely to go up in smoke anytime soon. You know, it's really interesting watching that because, of course, smoking is often associated with bad skin. Why is that? Well, you see, um, after the age of 25, um, you lose, just by getting older, you lose about 1% of your collagen for every year you live, and hence you get the sagging face and gravity takes over. Now, if you get excessive sun exposure, then that's as much as 2% a year. But if you smoke, you're losing as much as 3% of your whole collagen per year if you're a smoker. Now, we're not entirely sure because cigarettes have got literally so many toxins within the smoke. It's very hard to know which of those toxins are actually causing the damage, but there's no doubt that it causes damage. So it's the smoke in contact with your skin that effectively is causing that particular problem? Oh, no. It's actually the inhalation of the toxins and it's oh, then right. circulating within your bloodstream that actually causes the problem. So smoke actually contacting the skin, I doubt, would cause that much. So it's more just the inhalation of, of that smoke. Now, we talked a lot last time about different things. We, we spoke extensively about vitiligo. And if you haven't actually seen that episode, please do watch it because there's a lot of really great information there. But we've had quite a few questions coming in, particularly about acne, which we did touch on last time. And we talked about the different things, and you talked about how people get it and so on. One of the questions is about the various treatments. Now, you mentioned 
before that people will grow out of it eventually very few people beyond a certain age will still suffer from it but what are the sort of treatments you do because you did mention that actually as a dermatologist you can do things more than just the basic face washes yes i mean um first of all there's the over-the-counter products you can buy such as the benzoyl peroxides which are very useful um but really the ones uh, at, at more primary care level um patients are, well you the first line would be antibiotics with washes and creams um, which normally is done in primary care. Normally, by the time a dermatologist has seen anyone with acne, they've tried all the antibiotics and the washes and creams. Now, there are two, well, there are more options. There are quite a few options to treat acne. One other option is um, a medication called spironolactone. Now, spironolactone was originally invented as a anti-high blood pressure tablet. It wasn't very good at that. What it does do is oppose the male hormones. So in women with acne, uh, whose um, acne is hormonally based, spironolactone can do very well. In fact, it has a whole host of effects on the female body. One is to thicken the scalp hair, lessen the amount of facial hair, reduce the acne and also cause weight loss. So it can be very, very useful That sounds treatment. ideal for many people. Yeah, uh, <laughs> now, the other... but. Uh, Often, the drug only works while you're on it, unfortunately. There's another one called isotetanoin, which is a oral tablet, which is highly effective in the treatment of acne. In fact, studies have shown you can get um, the acne being removed for at least uh, 80 to 90% of people will not have the acne recurring for five years, and that's how long the studies have been going for. But in my experience... Uh, isotetanoin, oral isotetanoin, can actually eradicate acne altogether. Very effective drug. And I, I'm supposing that the real key here is speaking to an expert, making sure you're talking to somebody who can identify your particular type of acne, because as we've uh, said, you know, there are different types, and therefore understanding the real cause behind it is really important. How can people make sure that they are talking to someone who is an expert and not someone who claims to be an expert? The first and foremost thing, you should go onto the uh, General Medical Council website, GMC website, is very useful. You can check whether a specialist is on the specialist register. Now, be careful here because the doctor might be on the GMC register, but make sure they're on on the register for their speciality because you've got a lot of people who like for instance do cosmetic dermatology who aren't dermatologists um, and they won't be on the specialist dermatology register so go on to the GMC website and make sure they're on the specialist register before you book with them. Now, a lot of the things we, t we talked about smoking actually before, and before I forget, with, with smoking we were almost assuming we were talking about maybe the drugs or um, regular cigarettes. What about, um, you know, the other alternatives to smoking like vaping and shisha pipes and things like that? Are, are they in the same category? Shisha's worse, believe it or not, because cigarettes actually got a filter in it. And with the shisha, you don't actually feel the smoke at all because it's cooled down. So you're actually inhaling a lot more nicotine than you normally would with even a cigarette. So shishas are just as bad, if not worse, than cigarette smoking. Now, I'm not aware of any research that shows whether vaping has any harmful effects on the skin at all. Uh, thus far, I'm sure there will be research in the future, but I'm not aware of any research that shows vaping can harm the skin per se, because nicotine um, directly may or may not um, damage the skin, but I suspect it probably does. So there probably is some damage, but certainly not as much as smoking cigarettes. The next thing I want to come to is scarring, because scarring, and we're going to see a video in our second half of the show about people who have been um, facially disfigured for whatever reason. But actual scarring caused by maybe by acne, you know, severe acne, um, and maybe operations because of an accident or something like that. How effective is getting rid of scars these days? Well, you see, unfortunately, there's no real way of completely eradicating scarring 100%. You can never get 
the skin back to its original, but what you can do is make it look a lot better. Now, the modern laser treatments, the more advanced ones, the recent ones, are exceptional at treating scarring. Highly effective, what we call fractionated lasers. So not only um, are these lasers safer um, and with fewer side effects, but they're much more effective now. So the modern lasers are extremely good at treating scars, especially acne scarring. We talked a little bit last time about moisturising and the fact that actually as you get older, yes, you do need to moisturise. We see a lot of programmes about what is good, what isn't as good, um, what's effective. And sometimes some of these studies have shown some of the cheaper ones have been better. Let's talk again a little bit more because we've had a few questions about these cosmetics, moisturisers, anti-wrinkling creams and all those kind of things. What's the science behind it all? Well, you see, I agree with you. With the moisturizers, I mean, you have to be careful if you're acne prone that you have to have oil-free moisturizers. That's very important because if you've got acne prone skin, you don't want something too greasy because that will block your pores and uh, make your acne worse. But other than that, there's no advantage. You can spend anything from 50p to 500 pounds on a moisturizer if you want to. And there really is no point in spending um, any more than a certain amount. So really, just because something is more expensive as a moisturizer, it doesn't make it any better. For example, um, which magazine did a survey on sunblocks? So they looked at the effectivity of sunblocks and how much people pay for these sunblocks. And I won't name the, a, very, a supermarket known for its cheap products was actually the best. Its sunblock was £3.57, the cheapest of the lot, and was found to be the most effective, so more effective than a £100 sunblock. So really, when it comes to sunblocks as well, you, how much you pay does not determine the quality of the product at all. They often will claim these sort of magic ingredients, don't they, about yeah, it'll do this, it'll do that, so on. What about nature versus chemical in that respect? There are some people who believe that actually putting organic materials on your skin, you know, things like, for example, we've, we've heard about metals in deodorants and antiperspirants. What about that question about natural products going on your skin versus chemical? Is there any evidence to suggest that one's better than the other? Not really, no, there aren't. I mean, I think organic is used as a marketing ploy more than anything. Um, so, no, I don't think organic. But, however, there have been recent advances where there's a, quite a, there's a um, in Guatemalan Red Indians, when they go hunting, they chew on a fern leaf, and um, this fern leaf, after chewing on it, they go out hunting, and they don't get sunburnt at all. And later on, uh, it was found that the active ingredient in this fern leaf is a substance called polypodium leucotomos. Now, polypodium leucotomos is, comes in capsule form now, and there's a halal <laughs> version as well. Of it. Make sure it's halal, because a lot of the polypodium leucotomos capsules you can get have got pork gelatin in them, but they are halal versions and make sure you do get the halal version but that as a capsule and it's also impregnated in sunblocks now and polypodium leucotomo space oral capsules and also sunblocks have actually been found to be very powerful antioxidants and we're now using the oral version of it as an anti-cancer as a pre cancer preventative and it's a herbal one so there are arguments where herbal treatments are highly effective as well. Because the, on that subject, we were talking about, just now about like deodorants and things, and the fact that if you put anything into your skin, say, for example, anything that's got very heavy levels of chemical in it or metals or anything like that, on your skin, like, for example, underneath your arms or on your face, that actually those are absorbing into your body and could be doing you some damage. They do, if they do so, they're in minute amounts because the skin is actually uh, made to keep things out. And that's one of the biggest problems we have to, as dermatologists. Actually trying to get the treatment into the skin is actually very difficult. And therefore, a lot of these substances actually do not get into the body in enough amounts to cause harm. So really, I wouldn't worry about... There was this scare some time ago where they found the people that used sunblocks actually had 
an increased incidence of skin cancer. And a lot of it was attributed to the chemicals within the sunblocks themselves, which wasn't the case. The real case was the people um, thinking that by wearing a sunblock, they could just go out in the sun, and they spent longer in the sun because they thought they were safe. They had a sunblock. So uh, the, these, uh, these people actually had increased incidence of skin cancer because they spent longer in the sun because they thought they were safe. Now, we're going to talk extensively in the second half of the program today about surgeries and some of the surgeries that people do from a cosmetic point of view. And we're going to get into, you know, sun tanning and actually the opposite is skin lightening. I just want to talk a little bit more, because again, we touched on it last time, about eczema and some of the other skin diseases, irritations and things like that. Well, first of all, not, not a lot of people know that uh, London is one of the major centers for eczema. It's got one of the highest eczema rates in the world. The other city that has very high rates is Wellington in New Zealand. Now, if someone migrates from, say, Mumbai to London, the, the actual uh, immigrant, the rate uh, is about 60 percent. So. 60% of, say, South Asians that come to London end up with eczema. And I remember we were talking a little bit about that last time, and it was what was really interesting was the fact that you say something about London that, that's doing that. But we, we, we're also seeing in, in kids, you know, a higher incidence of eczema than maybe before, a higher proportion of allergies than before, which then manifests itself in some form of eczema. What are the sort of best treatments for it? Can actually be treated, or is it one of those things that can just be controlled? Unfortunately, there's no cure for eczema, because really the basic uh, problem with eczema is there's a mutation or a damage in one of the genes called the filaggrin gene. And filaggrin actually keeps your cells close together. If there's a deficiency in that gene, they move apart. So you start losing water, and then um, allergens can get into the skin, and create allergies. So there's actually a problem with the barrier function of the skin. Um, so how um, migration into London should affect that, we don't know. But you are right. Not only are, are there more children with eczema now, in the old days we used to be able to tell parents, look, your child's going to grow out of eczema by the age of four. We're not really able to tell parents that anymore because a lot of children continue with the eczema uh, throughout their lives and they don't grow out of it after a certain age so they are so that's a different pattern emerging now do you get involved in allergy testing with foods and nutrients that people are consuming that could then come out in their skin is that something you get involved yes, in? yes we do there's two forms of allergy testing um or, well three forms really um one is called rast testing which is a blood test you can do for certain foods house dust and things like that. And then there's more accurate thing called prick testing, where we put prick a lot of different possible allergens into your skin. And if they come up in a big red wheel, then you're allergic to that substance. But the other thing uh, which we do when it comes to allergy testing is something called patch testing, which is quite different because that tests you for something you're in contact with, such as fragrance, such as metals, such as rubber, um, dyes in clothing, and that's a different test. With that one, we put strips on your back containing what you may be allergic to, and then two days later we take them off, and if you've reacted to any of those substances, that's what you're allergic to. So you have to be careful w w when you talk about allergy testing. There's various forms of them, and you've got to have the right one for your condition. And talking about allergies, um, I want to really go on to diet and how much your diet can affect your skin. So, for example, how much oil you're having, the right type of oils. Um, and, of course, water is a, is a massive issue, you know, where people are effectively just dehydrated. So tell me a little bit more about what we can do nutritionally to improve the quality of our skin, or certainly to give it the best chance. Well, I think acne was an excellent example um, it's still controversial as to whether diet can affect acne. There's a school of thought that says it doesn't, and there's a school of thought that says it does. And I, I actually belong to that school of thought that believes that diet has a big impact on acne. 
Now, one of the reasons why we're more able to say that diet may have more of an impact is because in the old days we couldn't measure insulin levels very easily. We can measure them very easily now. So foods that increase your insulin levels, um, such as chocolate, um, sweets, biscuits, if they increase your insulin levels, then you're more likely to get more acne. And, and what about regular skin problems? What about just things like the tightness of your skin? Do, are those foods like chocolate and the insulin-based ones, is that purely for acne or does that affect your skin generally? See, the, really the studies um, haven't really been done on whether sweet foods affect skin, but increasing your weight almost certainly does cause a negative effect on your skin um, because the more fat you have, the more testosterone you make, um, and therefore sort of weight gain per se uh, just like it, just like it's bad for your heart is also bad for your skin as well so being lean not being overweight is vital for uh, skin health and what about water we hear lots of things about water we should be drinking eight glasses a day or that kind of thing and then should it be water or is it okay to be drinking tea or other fluids Give us the viewpoint from a skin perspective on how much water we should drink to keep ourselves healthy. In the healthy individual, the healthy individual will know when they're thirsty. It's one of the most uh, common things that the human or any animal has is that they know when they are thirsty and therefore you drink water. Forcing yourself to ha have eight glasses is actually just going to mean that you're just going to pass urine more often, that's all. So forcing yourself to have three liters per day is actually doesn't do you any benefit at all. You can drink as much water as you feel your body needs, and your body will tell you how much water you need. Unfortunately, at the extremes of age, that's not the case. In the elderly, the elderly lose that ability to, um, to actually know when they're dehydrated. So in the elderly, you have to make sure that... Um, that water's constantly offered to the elderly, especially when they're unwell. And the same is for children at the other end. Children aren't very good at knowing when they need water. And so unwell children or unwell elderly people um, will need pushing to have water. But the normal healthy individual, uh, drink as much water as your first. And of course there's the urine test as well, isn't there, to make sure that it's the right colour. And that would give you an indication of whether you're hydrated enough. Yes, I mean the darker your urine is, um, the more um, dehydrated you are. And the more light coloured it, the better hydrated you are. Now we know water is an essential for life and for general wellness. Does it affect our skin? Does the amount of oil we have in our diet affect our skin? Does it, is there a way of giving our skin that little bit of elasticity that we're all looking for, for eternal youth, that we can actually do within our diet? Well, you see, it's quite controversial because uh, a lot of people and patients will anecdotally tell you that when I eat fatty foods, um, I get acne or some eczema patient will say, if I eat fatty foods, my eczema gets worse. Unfortunately, those studies haven't been done, but one of the major dietary things that makes eczema or most con conditions worse is alcohol. Alcohol really does make a lot of skin conditions worse, and especially excessive alcohol drinking is extremely bad for the skin. Well, we're going to talk more about the extremes of skin in terms of surgery after the break. But thank you so much so far. It's, it's fascinating talking about all of these things. Uh, now, we should explain and stress that should you suffer from any medical problems or have any health concerns whatsoever, it's always highly recommended uh, that you actually contact your doctor or GP as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. We've got lots more to talk about, specifically about surgery, but now it's time for a short break, so please don't go away. Hello and welcome back to The Health Show, where our topic today is skin care. We're now going to go to the Ivory Coast and a report about how, for 17 of her 20 years, Flora Dume has hidden from the world because of Noma disease, which leaves victims left disfigured. 
She's now nervously waiting for an operation that will hopefully repair her ravaged face, which she hopes will give her hope for a better life. For most of her life, Flora has been forced to shut herself away at home to escape insults and mocking glances. She developed a bacterial disease called Noma when she was three years old, which caused the growth to cover most of her face. It is because of this illness that my parents didn't want me to go to school. Because by going to school, people will laugh at me. Nine out of ten patients with Noma die from the disease and survivors are disfigured for life. To remedy this problem, this volunteer medical team offers free surgical care to treat patients' faces. In just one week, the team has operated on about 50 patients. The problem is that it reaches all levels. It reaches the skin, it reaches the muscles, it reaches the bone and it reaches the mucous membrane, the skin inside the mouth and nose. So we try to replace these tissues by bringing tissues from another part of the body. Some patients have to undergo several procedures, but all medical expenses are covered by the Ivorian NGO Smile One Day, which oversees the program. Through facial reconstruction, the association hopes to help Noma sufferers overcome exclusion. They are often rejected in their villages. They're people we take for sorcerers, who are not recognized as human beings. They have something striking and terrible that makes the whole population reject them. Flora recently had her surgery, and like many other patients, she is getting to know her new face with a smile. It's fascinating watching that report, and there must be a lot of conditions where people are severely disfigured. Is that something that you see very much? Um, not as much. I mean, there's conditions such as leishmaniasis, which are very common in the Middle East or countries where there's a lot of desert, which can be very disfiguring. But luckily, um, it's not very common in, in developing countries and in the West. Um, the, of course, the classic disfiguring disease is leprosy, which we hardly ever see in the developing West, but it is present um, in poorer countries. Um, the most, there are disfiguring conditions of the face, uh, acne being the major one, which can leave very severe scarring. But thankfully, a lot of the sort of infective diseases aren't very common in the UK at all. When it comes to surgery, because I know things like, for example, you do reconstruction, when it's things like cleft palate and things like that, that I presume you're probably in, involved in. How complicated is it to work on someone's skin, especially someone's face, which is so, you know, so important to people to visually look the best they can? Well, first of all, things like cleft palates are always done by, well, should be done by either plastic surgeons or ENT surgeons. Thankfully, dermatologists don't need to get into that because that's best done by ENT or plastic surgeons. The surgery that we do do as dermatologists is uh, removing tumors. Um, we tend not to, things like facelifts are done by plastic surgeons. So we tend not to do major surgery uh, apart from, say, removing tumours and so forth. So our surgery is actually quite minor. And we, we can actually change and rejuvenate skin via more modern treatments such as lasers, peels, and certain medications. But in terms of surgery, we always recommend that you see a very good plastic surgeon or in some cases an ENT surgeon. Let's talk about now general cosmetic types of skin care. So things like you talked about face peels, and I'm fascinated about face peels because we hear about that sort of taking off this outer layer of the skin things. Does, does it actually work? Yes, they do. Uh, pills do work, and there's lots of different forms of peels. There's the minor ones such as glycolic acid peels, and it all depends on the concentration of the glycolic acid you apply. Uh, and there's also th something called a trichloroacetic acid peel, which is more aggressive. Um, now, what they do is they remove the top layer of the skin and thereby generate your skin and has to repair the damage by creating more collagen, so they do work. But more and more, these peels have been replaced by the more advanced lasers. So the lasers are really, the modern lasers, 
of uh, gradually or really replacing the peels a lot. And do they do the same thing where they're sort of tricking the body into making more collagen, which gives you that elasticity? That's right. But with the laser, you see, you yourself can choose what dose, what depth you're taking your laser to. Now, with the peel, you're putting something on and hoping for the best and hoping it will do something you want it to do. So the laser are much more advanced than peels. But the truth of it is all of us want to go back looking 18 again. So how much can we actually really do to rejuvenate ourselves and how much do we just have to say, you know what, that's part of getting older? You know, there's some very interesting research done on anti-aging, actually, um, which showed that... Um, all of the anti-aging things that we do, people don't actually, people still guessed in blind experiments, people still guessed the age, but they thought you look better. Okay. So I really think that we can't claim to make people look, say, 10 years younger, but we make them look better. Um, in some cases, we can make them look younger, but in most cases, they look better for their age. And how about people who've actually damaged their skin? So they look older than they should be because maybe they've been smoking, maybe they've just had a really poor diet, maybe they had terrible acne when they were younger. Sun how exposure. much can and sun exposure? How much can it be reversed to get you back to where you should be for your age, or is it sort of once you've done it, you've done it, and it's just trying to keep it under control? from the future. Well, you can do it. Actually, the modern techniques can take you back. You can create more collagen. You can create more elastic tissue. There are now in uh, lunchtime facelifts that are available now where you insert threads along the face and then collagen gets produced around these threads and gives you a lift. So we are replacing more and more people want non-invasive things. So we're replacing things like facelifts with other procedures. But you can actually make people look, reverse that uh, by creating more collagen, by g giving people skin a lift, and, and also giving more volume to the skin as well. There are some very weird treatments out there. I mean, we heard, I, I forget what it was exactly she was doing, but Madonna was using forks. We hear about these rejuvenating injections. Maybe just take us through some of the more weird and wonderful and actually tell us, no, don't bother doing that because it's not going to work. Well, one of the big things that uh, was, was big in Japan is actually what's called snail facials, and we did a bit of research on it ourselves. And the snail actual uh, fluid that the snails make actually is very powerfully antibacterial. It's got things like hyaluronic acid in it which is what our skin uh, actually has a lot of. And if you add hyaluronic acid to the skin, um, it actually does rejuvenate it. So things I'm like... I'm going out in my garden this afternoon now, then, given that. <laughs> and, of course, some people, actually, the really strange ones is urine. Urine has got this uh, stuff called urea in it, which is a really good moisturiser. So sort of urine facials are uh, another way out thing. I wouldn't recommend it. I think there's better <laughs> options than that. So in your view, what is the best thing to do just to maintain good, healthy-looking skin without going to extremes, but just maintaining a good quality of lifestyle that's going to reflect then in your skin? First of all, don't smoke. Secondly, do not have excessive alcohol intake. Those two are very important. Um, make sure that your diet is a balanced diet so you've got enough of all of the different food groups, that you have enough vitamins, fruit and vegetables. Tomatoes have got this um, ingredient in it called lycopene, which is very good for the skin. So fruit and, uh, fresh fruit and vegetables uh, in good amount is extremely good for the skin. Green vegetables, which have lots of folic acid and iodine in them, also very good for your skin. What about all of these masks that we see people use, these facial masks, and then they put cucumber bits on their eyes and, and so on? Is that just more pampering than actually doing you any good, or does it do you any good? Well, they do, because a lot of cosmetic products contain what's called fruit acids, alpha-hydroxy acids, which are very good at hydrating the skin and also... Uh, stimulating collagen production. So a lot of the vegetable fruit-based um, treatments are actually very useful and they can work. I think we touched on the last program about Japanese women who, uh, mm. when they boil the rice, they wash their face with the water afterwards because it contains kojic acid. 
and that's antibacterial, evens out the skin tone as well. So there is something to these fruit or vegetable-based treatments. And what about um, exfoliation? You know, we, we hear a lot about scrubs. Is that effectively just like a very soft peel? Is it, how much good is that doing? It, exfoliation, if you've got very dry skin, is a no-no. Do not, if you've got dry skin, exfoliating it is just going to make it worse. So um, oh, the only thing I would, exf a situation I would exfoliate in is if someone's got oily skin. Um, because exfoliating an oily skin will exfoliate the oil for a start and make your skin feel better and stop your pores from being clogged. But exfoliation is not for everyone. It's mostly for those with oily skin that I would recommend that in. Now, one of the interesting things that uh, we noticed, we had some um, people write into us after the last episode, and one of the things that someone mentioned was how her skin had changed as she got older. She was, had very oily skin when she got, was younger, and then it suddenly became drier as she got older. It, is that a normal process? Yes, it is. As you get older, you lose uh, your ability to produce the thing that makes skin oily called sebum. So the amount of sebum you produce reduces over time. Now, the, the, the benefit of that is that as you get older, you're less likely to get acne. But the problem is you're more likely to get eczema as you get older because your skin's drier. So there's various forms of eczema which are more common as you get older. Now, especially in women, post, the, the, the women will notice a big change before the menopause. And then after the menopause, they'll notice big changes in their skin. The skin loses its elasticity, um, the skin uh, gets drier postmenopausally. So after the menopause, the women will notice a big change in their skin. And that's why things like HRT or hormone replacement therapy can be very useful in that situation. And you don't just need to get the drug form of HRT. There's also herbal alternatives to hormone replacement therapy, which can be very useful. And does that mean that when you get to that age that moisturising is probably even more important just to maintain a level of moisture in your skin? Exactly. Very important. And the place where, as you get older, where you get really dry skin are the legs. And so make sure you don't neglect the legs as you get older because you really do get a lot of dryness on the legs. And why is that? Why the legs? Is it just because it's an extremity of the body? or? Um, I think it's more so the fact that we're standing and there's a lot of pressure um, from all of the blood that's uh, in your circulation on the legs. So it creates a lot of pressure on the legs. And that's why when you do surgery on the leg, it takes a lot longer to heal than if you do surgery on the face. So it is that column of blood. It's a cost that humans have to pay for walking on two legs. I want to talk very briefly about, I know it's not an area that you are directly involved in, but you talked earlier on about cosmetic surgery. And we see on some TV shows some horrible stories of people who've gone to countries and had all sorts of treatments from, you know, having their noses corrected to, you know, literally stretching the skin back so they can hardly talk. What's your view on those kind of what I would call extreme treatments? Um, first of all, um, we would strongly recommend if you're getting any surgery down, like I said before, just the way you can search for a specialist dermatologist, you can search for a specialist plastic surgeon. So make sure that the plastic surgeon is on the specialist register in the UK. Now, going abroad may be cheaper, but in the long term, it can be extremely expensive if things start going wrong. And in general... Uh, we would not recommend that people go for cheap. There, there's a reason why there are cheap alternatives, <laughs> because, you know, they, 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 uh, they don't have the same standards that are required in the UK as you have in other countries. So it really can be very expensive in the long term. It's not something we'd recommend. And it's, again, it's, it's something that, you know, you are taking a chance because you don't have those guarantees. And at the end of the day, what what's some of the more permanent damage you can do by stretching the skin in such extreme ways, by doing some of this corrective surgery? Are there long-term negative effects that can happen to the skin, or is it just a case of it could go wrong? Stretching the skin per se doesn't cause problems, so, but if you overstretch it, you can get all sorts of problems, like I've had patients who have had 
uh, poor surgery where they can't shut their eyelids together properly. Now that can have serious consequences because there's a reason why you keep blinking and the reason why you can close your eyes when you go to sleep. Because if you leave them open to the elements, the cornea, the top surface of the skin dries up and that can lead to blindness in the end. So it's really important such a surgery around the eyelids is very important that it's done in the right way, else it can lead to permanent damage to the eyes, for instance. And again, you know, your skin generally, you know, needs to be healthy. But as we do get older, we get these sort of different sort of marks and, and things like that. Are there anything that can be done with any of these things? Or is it just, you know, you just have to accept that's part of the aging process? Well, you know what's very interesting about South Asians and Asians in general is that Asians tend not to get too many wrinkles. What happens in people of color is you lose the ability to control um, your colors. So what happens in Asians, rather than getting wrinkles, the main problem is differential pigmentation. So you'll get dark spots in different areas, or you'll get a situation where the forehead is darker than, say, the rest of the face. And thankfully, there are there is a lot you can do about this differential, make the uh, skin tone even in terms of color, because that's what really ages um, South Asians or people of a Asian type skin. But there's a lot you can do for that. And we talked a lot last time about vitiligo and the, the effects on that. But actually one of the things that you mentioned after the show last time was the, the fact that people are, there is this trend unfortunately in some South Asian countries of actually bleaching your skin deliberately. Yes. Now that is actually a well, one of the reasons why, how we know about the dangers of skin lightening is in the 1950s and 60s in South Africa, a lot of uh, uh, South African, South, black South Africans used to bleach their skin because if they had lighter skin, they'd get better jobs. And therefore, they'd use large quantities of uh, something called monobenzone, which is a permanent skin bleaching. And because they used it on such large areas of the body, it would absorb into their bodies and cause kidney failure, liver damage, and really cause significant organ damage. So we know that if you use these bleaching agents over large areas of your body, it can be extremely toxic and unhealthy. Now, we do use these bleaching agents um, um, under strict supervision as dermatologists. For instance, there's a condition called melasma, where um, if some people get too much sun exposure, or if people on the oral contraceptive pill or during pregnancy will get a mask of brownness on their cheeks and their forehead and their chin. Now that can be treated effectively as well and we use those treatments in that condition not to bleach the skin but to make it an even tone. It's really interesting, you know, hearing the difference according to the way you come from and the, and the tone of your skin and the effects that can have. You know, if you've got pale skin, you're more um, prone to the sun damage and so on and so forth. Age is a massive issue. You know, we've talked a lot about that during this interview, the fact that we all want to stay younger and we see every pill and potion on the market that claims to help us get younger and we've talked a lot about you know you can moisturize you can do certain things but ultimately you pretty well got to accept you might look healthier but you're not going to reduce age there are a lot of scientists though who are claiming they can reverse the signs of aging are, are you suggesting that actually they're all pretty dishonest oh we're not there yet i mean you can do it to a mouse in a lab at the moment and sure i think if you extend that technology in 20 to 30 years we probably will be able to do that at the moment, though, we are not in a position where we can reverse aging itself. You can make someone look a few years younger and a lot better, but I would contend that when someone says, I can make you look 10 years younger, that that's a very difficult thing to do. And so, so ultimately, don't spend these fortunes on these creams and potions. No, because simply because you can spend as much as five hundred pounds on a cream, and it really um, hasn't been shown to actually significantly affect your aging process. Anyway, there is a group of drugs called the retinols, which you can buy over the counter. And if these retinol groups are in large enough concentrations, they can have a marginal anti-aging effect. But again, it's marginal for often a very high price. The best is sunblock. If you want to spend money on 
preventing yourself from looking too old, buy a £3.50 sunblock <laughs> from a cheap su supermarket. That's probably the best thing you can do. That's really, really good advice. I'll go and buy some later on. <laughs> Coming back to the whole concept of general health and how that affects your skin, we've talked about diet, we've talked about what we put into our bodies. What about mental health? What about stress? What about all of those things? Do, is there any significance to your skin as a result of that? It's a huge difference. I mean, stress always exacerbates conditions such as eczema, uh, psoriasis. I pretend that even my patients tell me that when they get stressed, their acne breaks out even worse. So stress is a major factor. In fact, you know, some of the conditions such as there's a condition called alopecia areata where you lose hair or vitiligo. A lot of patients will have had a major stressful event and then they find some weeks later they get their condition or people who have a condition, the more stress they get, the worse that skin condition gets. So stress is a huge factor in skin disease. So it's interesting to see that it affects all areas of life indeed in, in, into your skin as well. So we've just got a, a few more minutes left and I really want to make sure that we've covered absolutely everything. And first of all, I want to just recap on some of your, if you like, golden rules about skin care, about making sure that you are looking after your skin in the right way. The sort of rules, if you like, the sort of tips that you give your patients. Well... Like I said, you know, try not to smoke, n try not to have excessive alcohol intake, make sure you wear a sunblock. Those three are the major things. And then make sure you have a balanced diet, make sure you have enough vitamins in your diet, and that can be got in, in terms of fruit and vegetables. Um, do not put on too much weight. And, of course, exercise is very good for your skin as well because keeping trim not being overweight can have significant positive impacts on your skin. And what about just general cleaning, you know, washing your skin? Is, do you have any recommendations of the types of soaps, the types of shampoos, the types of body lotions that we should be using? Is it the same thing where actually the cheaper ones are just as good? And the cheaper ones are just as good, I promise you. Now, like I said before, it all, a lot of it depends on your skin type as well. Uh, if you have oily skin, we would recommend something more stringent to wash your face with. Something You can get salicylic acid washes, glycolic acid washes. You can get them over the counters. If you've got greasy skin, we recommend those. Now, if you've got dry skin, you can get moisturizing liquid soaps, um, um, uh, which you can get from chemists, which are ideal. They cost, I think, about eight pounds for half a liter of the stuff, and they're <laughs> ideal. And um, so ask your pharmacist... Um, for uh, moisturizing soaps and so you, you should pick your washes and soaps according to your skin type. And just finally you've helped a huge amount of people in your career with their skin. What's been the most satisfying story, the most satisfying result that you've had? Only yesterday um, I treat, completed a treatment of vitiligo on a patient and she told me that I transformed her life and I could tell her life was transformed. She bounced into the clinic. She was happy. She was smiling. When I first saw her, she wasn't making eye contact. She was very nervous. You could tell she'd got a new job because she felt so confident. She had a new partner, and that made me feel great. I thought, wow, you've transformed someone's life. That's something good you've done. It made, and that's happening every other day where people, you're changing people's lives for the better. Very satisfying, especially when they tell you as well. Right, what a great way to end the show. Thank you so much indeed. Uh, but unfortunately, that is all we have time for. I'd really like to thank our guest today, uh, Dr. Sunil Chopra, uh, for sharing some of his expertise as a consultant dermatologist and give us a better insight into skin care over the two programs from a medical viewpoint. Now, once again, we must stress that should you suffer from any form of medical problem or health concern, it's highly recommended that you contact your doctor or GP, as the health show gives you an alternative viewpoint to the health concern being discussed. Again, as always, if you'd like any further information about any of the programs or subjects that we've discussed, then please do email us at healthshow at islamchannel.tv. In the meantime, thank you again for joining us. It's goodbye for me, and we'll see you again next week. Assalamu alaikum.